Hi everybody, I'm Brian McAnulty. I'm Catalina Butnaro. And this is Bright Lounge. Where we talk about design, technology and startups. Yeah, so this is the second episode. We are excited to be in Romania, Sinaia. It's a very, very pretty uh, city in the mountains. Yep. And in this episode, we're going to talk about uh, traveling while freelancing. Yeah, so uh, we've been traveling for a while and traveling is something that a lot of freelancers may want to do but are not sure of how to get started. So we're going to share some of our thoughts and experiences of how you can optimize your workflow for traveling. Yeah, also we're going to have an interview with uh, Jacob Kess, a uh, very well-known identity designer. He's going to share his thoughts about uh, traveling and uh, his ideas about logo design. Yep, so let's get into it. Okay. So as far as traveling, uh, there's a few important um, applications and things that you need a to designer get. can use. Um, the first thing I would recommend, uh, especially if you're going somewhere um, for a long period of time that you won't be able to get back to your home if you need to, yeah. is a backup hard drive yeah. for your laptop. Because if for some reason something would happen and your hard drive would fail, you want to make sure you have a backup that you can, a, a bootable backup also, so that you can boot right from that and be right up and running again. Yeah, also you can use uh, multi-purpose switches uh, for uh, different yeah. uh, countries that you're gonna travel. Travel adapters, yeah. Yeah, travel adapters, so you make sure you do uh, get your laptop plugged in wherever you are. Yeah. And a couple of uh, applications, let's see what can be useful. Yeah, so uh, a few applications that I think are necessary is uh, first Skype because uh, if you have to call clients or clients have to call you, you want them to be able to do that um, when you're in another country and not be paying $5 a minute for a cell phone or something like that. Yeah. And so what you have to do for that is uh, not just sign up but also have an online number so that way you're not asking your clients to sign up for Skype. That way you can just call a local US number or wherever you're yeah, from. Yeah, that you get through Skype. Also, you can definitely use uh, Dropbox for uh, file sharing and, um, and also for your different versions of the file. Yeah, so for yeah versions, file sharing, but uh, also for backups as well. Mm -hmm. um, and also for if you need to switch files between a home computer and your laptop while you're traveling. Yeah, yeah. One of the main advantages of Dropbox is that uh, it syncs with um, uh, various uh, devices and it is um, an application built for mobile devices as well. Yeah. So if you want to get some uh, apps that help you while traveling, whatever the app may be, you want to make sure that it does does work on various devices, whether it's iPhone or Android um, phone or anything else. You want to make sure that you have uh, that application on various devices. Yeah, and also um, one thing that can be very useful to people is uh, remote desktop access. So if you have a computer at home and even if you think you have all your files, but maybe it turns out, oh, you need this one file from three years ago or something. Yeah. Um, it's good to have the ability to access your computer from another location. Yeah, yeah. So that can be very useful. Yeah, also uh, VPN can work. Yep. And uh, that is useful because you can um, go on websites uh, that can be accessed only by US, but using the VPN connection, then you can also go on that website whether you are in a different country. Yeah, so certain websites, um, don't allow access outside the U.S. Um, because of various reasons. So for entertainment purposes and also for business, there are certain things that you may benefit from using a VPN connection with. And it can be things like Pandora for listening to music, but also things like PayPal, um, which PayPal may get frustrated with you if yeah. you start logging in in different countries. Yeah. And so that can be very useful. and. Uh, you can, there's free versions available, but usually that's not going to be fast enough, but they're pretty affordable yeah. um, to pay for. And very, very useful. Also, I guess the main question uh, that you uh, may want to answer uh, for is, do you have internet connection and do you have good internet connection yeah. when you're traveling? And the answer is definitely yes. 
Yeah. And it's surprising uh, that there are so many providers in Europe and in um, other parts of the world uh, that just um, allow you to buy a 3G card uh, for prepaid. one month, yeah. prepaid, yes, you don't have to have any contract with them. And so you can definitely have um, internet on your phone or, or on your laptop. But definitely if you're tra traveling for a longer uh, period of time, you want to make sure that you go uh, to a place that does have Wi-Fi. So yeah. it's not a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So internet is definitely the main thing that you're going to need. And a lot of people uh, may get nervous about how to get internet. But yeah, it is actually not hard to do. There's tons of places um, around the world that have open internet access. Um, a lot of cases you'll find faster internet than you even have at home. Mm -hmm. And yeah, also for people in the US, uh, you usually expect, oh, I can't get a 3G card because I need to, to buy it and pay for a two-year contract. But um, from my experience, like um, there's been places in Europe where uh, they'll even give you the card for free mm -hmm. without a contract and you just pay for one month. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it's surprising to see that the internet connection can be so much better in various other places. For example, in Thailand, we've recently found a place that provides... Um, 400, 400. Yeah. yeah. It's awesome. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, but also, it's important to ask yourself, do you uh, tell your client that you're traveling? Yeah. So this is a subject that... Um, designers may not be sure about and maybe a little bit concerned about um, do you really need to tell a client if you're going to travel or not and yeah. I feel that sometimes it's not a good thing to do um, other times it's fine if you're friends with a client and they know you Yeah. but with the less tech savvy kind of client uh, they may perceive even if you say oh yeah I'm going to completely be available mm -hmm. they may perceive it to be that you won't actually be as accessible or as efficient and they can't really understand that you can work completely the same way yeah. in any location yeah and for uh any type of client that you may have you do want to use some applications that help you figure out what's the best uh what's the time zone yeah. uh, down there and make sure that you are available uh, during the working hour for your client and also other applications that help you schedule messages or any other um task and it's important to schedule messages because you don't want to send an email that will arrive at 2 a.m. Yeah. Um, in your client's inbox. It doesn't really look very good. Yeah. Um, and also, you may want to try to find some um, applications that will help you organize yourself, uh, your own work workflow. Yeah. And make sure you have the right balance between having fun and working on everything. Yeah, I feel like it's definitely important to make sure you have a good amount of overlap in the time zone that you're in. and your normal home time zone that the client would expect you to be working in. And um, yeah, doing something like, even if you want to work at different hours, scheduling an email can be useful. Um, so that way your client doesn't become under the wrong impression that you're going to always be working late or something like that. It can even be useful at where you usually live if you prefer working late in the morning. And uh, so that's really useful. And overall, I feel that while traveling, um, it can help you become more organized. Yeah. Um, if you're doing it doing it well, um, it can help keep you organized because you realize what's essential and um, yeah. what you need to focus on. Yeah. Starting from the things that you bring with you to the things that you use uh, during your work, uh, definitely traveling. Traveling is not um, only inspiring, but it is um, a way to realize how to make the best of everything that you have. Yeah. So that's really cool. And now it's time for the interview with Jacob Kess. Yep. And we'll talk to you after that. We're here with Jacob Kess, identity designer. How are you doing, Jacob? Very well, thank you. Thanks for having us. So how did you get started with identity design? Uh, I guess I got started when uh, I really wanted to start my own business and blog uh, and I started creating my own brand and logo and I spent a long time on it uh, and I, at the time I didn't really know that it was identity design uh, mm -hmm. but after a while I just uh, researched more and read more books about it and I really fell into uh, 
identity design, I guess. Uh, and I felt, fell in love with logo design and branding, and it all just like fell into place. They all overlap, and I guess that's how I. St- and I started interviewing other identity designers, and uh, kind of went from there. Yeah, and cool. just learning from them. You're doing an like, awesome job with your own personal brand as well, with the blog that you have and everything that you do. It's just like the right, perfect image for an identity designer to project to um, potential clients and like fans, your fans. So it's awesome. Yeah. yeah thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, how uh, was your first experience with a big client? Uh, my biggest client, I guess was straight out of school. I, um, I finished school after three years of studies and uh, yeah. I flew to New York from Sydney and I started working for a design agency in New York and they had Disney on their books. Mm-hmm. So I guess that was my first big client and it was a big step out of school going straight from school to working for Disney and it was, uh, it was a really cool learning curve and they were a great client and obviously a lot of fun to, to play around with all their characters yeah. and yeah. All the magic and all that. So yeah, it was, that was the, my first uh, first uh, uh, experience with a big client, I guess. That sounds cool. pretty magical. Mm. <laughs> it's pretty cool, yeah. But did you have like an awkward experience with a client, having like weird requests from them, and just being put in a very strange situation overall? Uh, yeah, I, I guess you you're always bound to get some simple like I don't I don't know say stupid because sometimes they have merit to them, but um, you may not think it's a good idea, but it's worth trying. If you're not always right, the client's not always right. And yeah. sometimes you know that it just won't work, but sometimes uh, it actually will work. And uh, I guess those stupid ideas can lead down different paths. So it's not, it's not you shouldn't uh, get rid of them entirely. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's good advice. <laughs> yeah. Um, so <laughs> next thing I was going to ask actually is, do you have uh, any pieces of advice you would give freelancers who are interested in getting started in identity design? Uh, Definitely, it doesn't just go for identity designers, it really goes with learning across the board and I think practice and research, reading books, um, talking with other designers and really trying, I I guess there's no like magic button, you have to actually put the effort in and um, you learn from that and that's the biggest piece of advice, there's no no secret, Uh, it's hard work and um, you learn from experience, so keep at it and don't give up. So yeah. that's my advice. Yeah. Is there anything that uh, you had to learn the hard way as you were growing as a designer? I'm still learning. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Definitely. definitely. Uh, you learn a lot of things along the way, and some things you just can't learn in books or from other people. You learn from yourself, and um, you you grow from that. So yeah, it, it's, it's bound to happen, and it's going to happen throughout your whole career. So get used to it. That's what I was. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's cool. Um, we've been um, uh, reading your blog a lot and um, noticing how you have all like a special talent to use design to um, influence people's attitudes and like just raise money for causes and do all that. So, um, the question that would be interesting to know: Can design actually influence social change in any way? Can you brand the cause and like make people um, contribute to that? Yeah, definitely, 100%. Um, you can really brand anything, uh, but you can definitely brand for a good social change. And uh, I guess it's not always about branding. You don't have to brand everything. Uh, sometimes you just need um, people to listen to you and uh, hear what you have to say. And I guess social change comes about that. If you're a leader and they want to hear what you're all about, then uh, they'll help you achieve your goals and help others, help others as well. So mm. your whole it goes hand in hand. Mm-hmm. But is like design a very persuasive tool that you can use to to just help them uh, realize your vision and like realize what the whole cause is about and everything. Yeah, definitely. Design uh, goes a long way. Uh, obviously, I'm going to say that I'm a designer, but yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah it does go a long way with uh, helping people recognize uh, the, the business or the organization and about what they do and yeah. uh, what they're all about. So yeah, it does go a long way. Yeah, because yeah. usually the, the main the standard approach would be to have all the statistical da- data and say like, oh, um, thousands and millions of people are in this position, in this situation, can you help them? But like it, when you um, 
take that idea and put it in a visual form, it's it, it has it can more be really impact. Powerful. So yeah. you're, yeah, yeah, it's awesome what you're doing with uh, helping people in Japan and everything. So, yeah, yes, yeah. there's all different ways you do it. You can do it. Um, I I had no idea. I, like uh, when the tsunami, tsunami hit. Uh, I just released a small graphic and I had no idea what I actually was going to do. And I was amazed at how many people actually picked it up and what a small little graphic could uh, achieve and help raise, like, uh, I think it was like 20 grand or something in, in mm -hmm. a matter of, week, of a week. And I was like, wow, I was not expecting that. Yeah, really, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, it was great. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Usually, um, identity designers have... Uh, smaller jobs and they they just have to deal with uh, working on a logo um, project and that's it but how, what would you do to just take that project and um, make it uh, a long-term project and just get more involved in the branding strategy with the client overall I guess the relationship with the client is a, a great place to start and it's about building that trust up and um, if you do a good job on the logo design they're going to trust you with more work and Maybe you can put things up in there and uh, give stuff for them, give thoughts to them for them to think about yeah. mm -hmm. about what can be achieved through design and uh, strategy, uh, and how you can fit all that in with their business business objectives. So, uh, I guess that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That sounds okay. good. And uh, so, during uh, your travels, have you noticed uh, any kind of cultural differences? Um, like as far as with how identity design has evolved in different places, like has there be, ever been anything you've seen that you haven't expected? Uh, I wouldn't say evolve because I, I, I don't know the, the countries or cultures enough to say, see the evolution of design there. Yeah. But you can definitely go to other countries and see how different it is, like the typefaces, the, the colors, the style even, and how, how different it is to Western or um, Asian cultures or whatever, wherever you are, it's, it's always going to be different and uh, it really depends where you're at and uh, I don't know how to compare but um, even, even like America and Europe is different, uh, there's yeah. different yeah. styles and uh, even though they both, both speak English, uh, they're, yeah. they're totally different. Yeah, so. yeah definitely. Um, so where have you traveled and do you have any interesting stories to share with us about that? Where have I traveled? Um, yeah. I think I think I'm up to 34 countries now and wow. um, 28 states of the U.S., which I want to figure out, want to do the rest by in the next couple of years. So it's, I've been nice. quite a bit and I love traveling and it's great to see the world and uh, you do learn a lot and you learn about other cultures and yeah. uh, I highly recommend it. It's like one of my true passions as well. Yeah. 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 You also talked to us in our previous interview for... Uh, the newsletter about your adventure in um, Cambodia, I guess. Uh, yeah. Is there any similar story that is like fun and exciting and always want to share with people from your travel experiences? Uh, there's so many stories. You can come out from one trip with like 20 stories. Um, yeah. It's hard to go off the bat like that, but uh, there's, there's really hundreds. And I guess um first thing that came to mind was in the Swiss Alps when it was like, It'd been sunny every day for like two months of just like traveling around Europe. And then you go, we went to the Swiss Alps and it was the only rainy day of the trip. And it was literally, we had real we camping up in the Swiss Alps and uh, it, it poured and poured and pissed down rain, like, like no tomorrow. And we're in tents and I just remember like the whole, all the water going underneath the tent and everything being soaked. And I don't know, that was just one of the experiences that yeah. uh, I, I remember. I, I get, it's not really a surprising experience, but I just remember that all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but when you have to travel uh, and you also have to work on a project, do you do something to optimize your workflow while, while traveling, like using specific apps or I don't know? Just Yeah, well, I, when I uh, traveled in the past, I made it a, uh, a goal not to take anything with me. Mm -hmm. um, but I've recently got a MacBook Air, yeah. um, which is great, so I can... Uh, the 11 inch, which is the, tiny, the smaller one, which is very light and uh, nimble yeah, and gets packed really away. Small. And, uh, it's, I've got, got everything I need on the run, so the Creative Suite and the emails which, and Dropbox, and they're my main tools that I use for on the go. Um, but generally, I try not to take my work with me when I travel. Uh huh. 
Yeah. I, I think people work better once they're in a um, their own comfortable work environment. So you get more creative and you get used to working in different environments. So, but sometimes it's good to travel as well. Um, that's a good way to get good ideas too. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. Um, but anything else you're passionate about except traveling and logo design? What do you do to just... Um, design, logo design, branding, identity, yeah. um, sport. I'm into sport a lot. Um, I would like to be more into sport if I had more time. But um, and blogging as well, uh, social media. I love the internet. I guess I guess yeah. all the typical things. Yeah, <laughs> takes up a lot of time. <laughs> like playing any musical instruments, uh, anything like that. Um, I could I could show you, but it would be pretty terrible. <laughs> <laughs> what do what instruments do you play? I used to play the drums uh, many years ago, like ten years ago, and but that's no longer. Um, yeah, I don't know. I've, uh, I like uh, going to bars and <laughs> clubs and all that. Mm -hmm. I don't know, just normal stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Cool. So, what's something that excites you right now at the moment? Like, can be anything. It doesn't have to be design related. Just something going on or something that is exciting. Uh, living in New York is pretty exciting. It's great. <laughs> It's uh, so much to do here and. I'm loving it. It's very exciting, and yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Okay, Jacob, that was absolutely awesome, and thank you so much for talking to us. And Thanks, Sam. Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll uh, keep in touch, and we'll do. Yeah. Okay, Jacob. Yeah. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Audible is offering a free audiobook download and a 14-day free trial to Bright Lounge listeners. This is a great opportunity for you to listen to popular books such as the Steve Jobs biography. I love listening to audiobooks while working, and I like that I can continue to listen to them when I go out on my iPhone or iPad. There are over 100,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. So check out www.audibletrial.com slash brightlounge to choose your free audiobook today. So that was a great interview with Jacob. Yeah, very interesting ideas. It's awesome that he's traveling so much. And next we're going to talk about multitasking. Yep, so since we were talking about workflows while traveling, uh, we thought it would be a good time to share thoughts on if multitasking is a good thing or not, how yeah. it impacts your workflow. Yeah. So I think that there's definitely times when multitasking can work and be efficient, but there's also times where it would not be. So one example, where I think it can be a good thing is uh, uh, a musician who is trying to learn how to sing and play an instrument at the same time. When you first try to do that, it will just not work out. You just can't do it. But as you practice and get better at it, you'll eventually get to the point where you can do both things at once yeah. and just effortless. Just, you don't have to think about yeah. that you're doing those two yeah. things. Yeah. So that's something where it's a it's a good thing, where it definitely works yeah. and is efficient. But so the ability to multitask is basically connected to how complex the, the skill that you have to learn and yeah. acquire is. And if it's something that is a, a higher level um, activity a, that requires a higher level uh, cogn cognitive function or um, more resources on your yeah. part, then it's going to be very difficult and maybe counterproductive. Yeah. I agree. So, um, for a lot of people, a lot of people have workflows where they'll have lots of windows open on their computer. Um, that's something that I have tons of apps open, filling every possible space on the Mac. Yep. And um, there's a few apps that um, allow you to help concentrate better if you want to focus on one thing at once. Um, I know uh, Concentrate is a popular Mac app that will do that. But I feel like uh, all of those apps are too invasive. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happens is uh, they'll block you from using another application yeah. or have different kinds of alerts that... Um, are intrusive. Pre pre yeah, prevents you from doing things or intrudes on what you're trying to do. Yeah, and your brain will perceive those uh, notifications um, as uh, penalties for uh, wanting to check out something else. Um, so it may not be a productive state of mind because you know that you are 
uh, being limited by our application to do whatever you want to do. Yeah. And um, definitely uh, there are apps that encourage uh, multitasking, but there are apps that uh, help you um, not multitask so much and just focus on what you have to do. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, a little bit different from the apps that try to keep you on one app, but uh, I just recently found this app just by coincidence uh, called Awareness for the Mac. And uh, what it does is after every hour, it will just make a bell sound that's um, the sound of a Tibetan singing bowl, which is used um, at the beginning and end of the meditation sequence. And uh, what's interesting about it is it's not invasive at all. So there's no way that it's intruding on your workflow. And it's not meant to prevent you from using an app um, or help you focus on one thing, but it's meant to make you aware of how long you're spending on your computer. So if you've been on your computer for three hours or two hours and haven't taken a break, um, you can be aware of that without things popping up in your face. Um, so you can take a break when you want to instead of something saying, yeah. okay, time to take a break and um, you're not really ready to do that yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a very, very useful application. And uh, I feel like um, um, nowadays it's interesting that you're trying to uh, focus on activities uh, in front of the computer. Uh, because um, the main way that you interact with a computer or a mobile device is by using your visual um, yeah. uh, sensory channel. And uh, that's very tricky because usually visual distractions are the most, uh, how should I say, counterproductive or the most common, um, yeah. especially when you're uh, using uh, laptops, yeah. mobile devices, you yeah, have all so these notifications pop popping up. Yeah. And what I can, what I can see happening um, is um, with applications that require a lot of focus, then you can have a full screen mode or any other mode that allows you to um, just experience um, that um, environment, working environment, yeah. and just focus on that. Yeah, uh, we're in a time now where we surround ourselves with information and you'll have notifications popping up on your desktop, on your phone, on everything. And even um, if you're the type of person that prefers not to see those things and to turn those things off, yeah. Um, still, like even if you're trying to check an email for something that you need to look at a resource or download a file that you need to get, um, you can easily be distracted by seeing, oh look, I just got this new email came in, or oh, what's this link, and going there to check that out. Yeah. So yeah, I agree that um, yeah. moving towards um, having a full screen option for a lot of apps and getting you more immersed in just that app and allowing you to focus can be a good thing. Yeah. And I feel like that's uh, that Apple's kind of moving in that direction with uh, Lion. And right now, at the moment, uh, something like an iPad, um, especially an iPad, and some other tablets too, I guess, um, you're in one application. So yeah. when you're using it, you're just experiencing that application aside yeah. from push notifications. Yeah. And uh, that can help you focus. But I think yeah. full screen can be good. Yeah. On the other hand, there are activities where you do have to multitask a lot, especially when you're talking to different clients and you have to check out a couple of resources and check out emails and check out other documents. Yeah. Um, and you do have to multitask in that case. So what you can do is that you can use uh, an application such as Flow uh, that uh, transforms any uh, window in a browser into um, uh, application mm -hmm. in your taskbar. Fluid, I think. Fluent. Yeah. Um, it's useful because you just launch that single um, um, application. Yeah, it's not an application. Instance, yes, yeah. e exactly. And but it it does help you uh, not to be tempted to just open another page or another tab. Yeah. So it does help have uh, instant access to something that you need and uh, keep yourself just focused on that. Yeah. Overall, I think it's important that. Um, you find a specific workflow that you're comfortable in and um, get used to doing things a certain way, which can help you um, be more focused and get more done. Yeah, so that was pretty much it for uh, the second episode of Bright Lounge. 
Um, we would like you to comment and send suggestions regarding um, our uh, interviews or our topics. It would be very useful. Yep. And also you can find us on YouTube, Mail, iTunes and several other channels. And uh, thank you very much to Vazar, which is our partner. Our video host. And uh, it's great they allow us to have iOS optimized streaming so you can watch this on your iPhone or iPad. And uh, they have a, a lot of really great features that we like. Yeah, it's a great service, so check it out for your own podcast. Yeah. And until next time, we wish you the best, travel a lot, and just keep in touch with us. Yep, see you soon. <laughs>